Welcome everyone to cell phone photography tips for you. Um, today we're going to talk about quite a few things regarding photography and regarding cell phones specifically. Some of the things that we'll kind of consider and cover today are one, why are cell phones so great? Well, it's very convenient to cart them around in your pocket so they're very portable which is great they tend to be very easy to use so you don't have a lot of different components especially like with the DSLRs where you have lenses you have flashes you have all kinds of peripherals that you attach to your camera and then it's easy to catch the moment there are a lot of times where I'll be walking around and I won't always carry my camera but I always have my cell phone with me so under the hood you're gonna have a lot of different specifications with phone Phones. We have so many variety when it comes to phones, even more so than with, uh, you know, DSLR cameras or point and shoot cameras and things like that. Cell phones are, are what we carry around every day and they come in all shapes and sizes, including the camera. They come with a variety of lenses these days. Uh, before, you know, five years ago, you only had one lens to worry about. Now you have two, you have three, sometimes even four. So, you know, you're going to have to consider those things and what's the right cell phone for you. And then the age old question, there's always Apple versus Android. So we're going to talk about sensors and megapixels. So your camera sensor is comprised of two parts, the size of your sensor and the pixel count. Uh, cell phone camera sensors tend to be very small because they are packed into a tiny phone, which means that your pixel sizes are also very small. So let's take that into perspective. So if you have a um, large DSLR full frame camera, it's going to have a much larger sensor. So that means 16 megabytes worth of pixels are fitting into this large bucket and they collect a lot more light because they're bigger pixels. But if you take 16, mega, 16 million pixels and pack them into a bucket the size of a thimble, your pixels are tiny. They are very, very small, which means they have trouble collecting light at times. You do have lens variety these days. So that's one thing to really consider when you're buying a cell phone. Do you need one, one camera lens? Do you need two? Do you need three? Do you need four? What is it that you want to do? So there's varying different uh, focal lengths. You have your wide lens, you have your ultra wide lens, and then you have your standard lens or you have your telephoto lens. And then again, Apple versus Android. It is gonna come down to the operating system and what you're used to. Moving on, we are going to talk about photography. So we are going to cover a few of the elements in photography and just kind of cover the basics. And then I want to take a look at two different phones and their camera settings and features. And then we're going to talk about evaluating light, evaluating composition, and kind of looking at the scene as a whole and what to do to make your pictures look better. Let's begin with aperture. Aperture can be defined as the opening in a lens through which light passes to enter your camera and then ultimately fall onto your sensor. So as you see the blades open up and light passes through. What it can affect is first the amount of light that falls onto your sensor of course, but secondly and more importantly is your depth of field. And I've always kind of struggled to explain this concept to people, but basically it's the area in which your subject will be in focus. Um, so as you see the woman walk closer to the lens, she becomes sharper in focus. Be behind her everything is out of focus and then there's going to be a section in front of her that is also going to be out of focus when she walks to that specific spot is when she's the sharpest so that is what depth of field really does the next thing we're going to talk about is the camera shutter so shutter speed is the length of time that the camera shutter is open exposing the camera sensor to light this is going to be defined in fractions of a second because it is time. So when you press down that shutter, it's going to open up the lens. It's going to flip these curtains one right behind the other to expose the sensor to light. It's going to affect is the amount of blur in motion. So for example, if you're taking um, a shot of something moving, 
like for example someone swimming and you want to freeze that action you're going to need a higher shutter speed and that's going to freeze it without any blur but that means you need a lot of light on the opposite end what if you wanted to take pictures of stars well stars don't have a lot of light so you would need a longer length of time for the shutter to be open and then you'd be able to capture starlight the last thing we're going to talk about when it comes to photography is ISO. So ISO is defined as the sensitivity of your image sensor. Basically those little pixels that are collecting light, ISO changes how sensitive they are to light. What it can affect is the balance between aperture and shutter speed, but it can also affect how grainy your image becomes. As you can see in this illustration at ISO 100, the image is not grainy and this is taken at, you know, probably fairly late sunset. So there's not a lot of light. We, our eyes adjust very well so we can see everything, but a camera doesn't adjust as well. So at ISO 100, their shutter speed was probably through the roof. Um, you know, they're probably recording for, for various seconds. At ISO 800, we see we start to get a little bit of grain and we double that at ISO 1600, we're seeing a lot more grain. And then at ISO 3200, it is fairly visible. So this is going to degrade the quality of your image. So you kind of have to play a balancing act between your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture to get the best results. Next, we're going to take a look at two different cameras on two very different phones and the settings and functions that each have. Let's take a look at my Note 10 Plus. So when I open it, it's going to be automatically in photo auto mode. And I do have the scene optimizer that I can turn off or that I can turn back on. And when I turn it on, you'll see that it changes some things slightly, adds a little bit of contrast and maybe a little bit of vibrance. And it tells me that I'm photographing food. Um, then we're going to take a look at this little gear here. And that's basically going to allow me to go in behind the scenes and tell my phone where I want images to be saved. So I'm not going to go into that right now. Next, we're going to take a look at flash settings. So flash is going to be off, automatic and on. I tend to leave my flash off and only turn it on when I absolutely need it in a scene. Um, so it's really by preference, so you can have it in auto or not. Then you have your timer, which mine has two, five, and 10 seconds. So that is going to delay the picture once I take it. And then above that, I have my resolution sizes. So this phone allows me to take images in various resolutions, including one by one, which is very standard for Instagram. Um, and then 16 by nine, which is what we're used to seeing with video. And then four by three, which was standard for old video back in the 90s and 80s. Um, and I keep mine at full resolution because it allows me to crop things. And then I have motion photo on and off, which allows me to kind of stabilize the image. But if I was in the middle of an earthquake, it would not help. So, you know, just use it sparingly. Uh, the next thing we're going to take a look at is the fact that my HDR is always on and it's very hard to turn off, but you can turn it off. And then we have filters. So I have various filters that I can use. I have beauty filters. I have my filters, which I can create. And then I have filters in general. And I don't really use these at all. I mean, you can kind of see that you can add them and you can change the intensity with that slider, which is great. I mean, if I want to take some black and white images, that's great or something that's very desaturated. But I tend to like working with the original and then changing everything in post. So that way I can really dial in the settings that I want. Okay, so let's go back. Now we're going to take a look at the shutter button. And it's going to show me also the last image that I took. So I could go in there and then that little rotation spin wheel would allow me to kind of take uh, do the front face. And right now I moved the floating shutter button, which I was 
trying to move but it doesn't let me while I'm recording so I wasn't able to move it but basically I can take that shutter button and put it in another corner so that way if my hand can't reach the button I can still do it um, from there I also have the pen which allows me to use um, the pen as a shutter so you know that's one of the main reasons why I really purchased this phone is it had the camera that I wanted to use something that I could really kind of take with me all around so now I'm showing you that you can kind of pinpoint where you want to focus just by tapping the screen um, so if I focus on the background it's going to optimize the scene for the background and if I focus on the apples it's going to optimize the scene for the apples if I press hold it will lock the actual um, focus to the point that I wanted it to so it turns yellow and then with the slider I can kind of change the exposure values a little if I slide up it's going to be more gained more everything's going to be brighter and if I slide down it's going to be uh, lower exposure for me to uh, access the pro features I have to go to the more and then I have my pro right there so I can go to the pro features so this gives me full control of the camera I'm able to change everything that I want including the ISO as you can see if I go up or down it is changing the sensitivity of the sensor to the light that I have right now and then the next one is going to control both the aperture and the shutter speed. I have only two switches for my aperture, so it goes between 1.5 and 2.4. And then with the slider, I'm able to move around and decide what shutter speed I need. So the higher shutter speeds, my screen goes completely, completely black. And then if I kind of go backwards now I can see the scene again so I'm gonna stick around right here and then I'm gonna tap the screen to refocus the image and then the next button we're looking at is standard and this is where I can kind of use the sliders to change things right now before I take the image as I said I really don't like doing this so I leave these sliders alone I do it in post the next thing we're going to look at is the focus system. So I have auto and then I have the manual focus system. And how I kind of manually focus is I just start using the slider on the side. And then as it starts to focus on the area that I want to focus on, I get these green lines that's telling me those edges are sharp. And that will kind of lock that in. And then we have our white balance, which is just telling the camera what white is in the situation. So I'm just kind of eye eyeballing it right now, kind of looking at these apples and seeing that if the colors kind of match. And that's how I'm doing it. But then you can also set it to auto if you really need to. And then again, we have our timer. So 2, 5, and 10. I have my resolution sizes. Again, the same sizes that I have on the other side. And then I can spot meter, I can center meter, or I can meter with other options. And then I have center focus um, locked. So that way I don't have my camera kind of going everywhere. Uh, so that is basically my camera in a nutshell. Now let's take a look at an iPhone 11. So when you open it up, it's going to be in photo mode and you can tap it to focus on various areas and you can tap and hold to lock the focus to that area and then use this little sun slider to either change the exposure to be higher or lower um, depending on your situation. So basically the you have a couple different things available. You have the shutter option right here that allows you to kind of slide the shutter up to one second. I really wish they would tell you the fractions because I'm not really sure where I am in terms of the shutter. Um, and then if you tap on the left hand side that little arrow, it'll give you these features. So then I can change my flash to auto off or on. Um, I can again access that shutter speed up to one second max. The next one is going to be for live pictures. So it'll take like burst images and kind of create like a little picture gif. And then we have our ratio. So we have square, we have four by three, starting with four by three. And then we have one by one, again, kind of Instagram look. 
And then we have the full 16 by nine, which is what we're used to seeing with video. The next one is our timer. So this iPhone 11 only does three and 10 seconds. So that kind of limits things a little bit. And then the last button is going to access all the filters. So you're able to kind of go through the filters and see which one you would like to add um, and then dial it in. I again like using the original and not changing anything before I take my image. And that's basically going back to um, regular photo mode and I can go ahead and lock my focus and take an image. Now the iPhone has a few different camera features that you can take advantage of. So photo is going to be very standard and then we have this portrait feature which kind of has some very different lighting situations that you can take advantage of or kind of create a look out of. So I was kind of playing around with this and seeing what it does. So the first one of course is a natural light. So it's kind of just looking at the scene and shaping the light the way it is naturally. And then again, you can lock that focus and you can use that slider to change your exposure a tiny bit. Um, and then the next one over, I believe, let's see, this one is studio light. So this is really if I had lights set up like flashes and things like that, so I didn't really take anything. And then I played around a little bit with the contour light because I wanted to see if it would really change the direct, like the shadows in the, in the situation. And it did quite a bit. So I was happy to see that. And then we have this like stage light, which really gives you like a spotlight look it really just only takes a picture of what you see in the middle and you can't really move it around so I wasn't really happy with it um, and then the high key mono light and things like that so these are very like spotlighty pictures and I, I, I played around with this a little bit saw what it could do um, it's kind of a fascinating little feature so we can again turn our flash on and then use our timers. We do have filters again on top of this so you could really kind of create a very custom look. And then with the F you can change your aperture so that was really nice to see. So as you can see on the lower end if I lock my focus to that front and I really bring our aperture all the way open even the back apple was out of focus and as i go high i can see all the way to those back curtains right there it's sharper so that will give you your depth of field and change it for you the next thing we're going to talk about is evaluating light so when you walk into any given scene you're going to evaluate how much light there is in the scene or how much light is missing from the scene that you really need um, it's taking a look at what direction it's coming from, at what the values it's giving you, at what kind of tones it's giving you, and, and really kind of seeing the whole picture before taking a picture. So the first thing you would consider is where the direction of the light is hitting. Is it soft? Is it harsh light? You know, in this first picture we have like of the leaves, it's very soft, very muted light. Whereas the mountains are getting really hit with the light and you see that in the foreground, it's getting kind of dark. Um, and you know, we're getting a lot of shadows in those trees. Then we have the quality of light. Is it very harsh or is it very soft? So in the little boy's picture, the light is coming from one direction. And as you can see, his, like on the side of his face where the light is coming from, his cheek is like almost got no detail from how high and hot that light is on his face. But then on the other side, it's very soft and very muted and we have deep, deep shadows. So it's creating some kind of hard shadows for him. Whereas in terms of the bee, it's very soft light. It's very muted. He, there's hardly any shadow in this bee. And where direction it's coming from, is it falling on your subject or is it behind your subject? In the picture with the girls, the light is falling on them. Yes, it's very soft and very muted light, but it is falling on them because we can still see their features. Whereas opposed to the picture with the couple, the light is behind them kind of, even though they're facing the light, we're taking the picture with the light behind them. So it's creating a silhouette. So where the shadows are being cast from your light. 
The next thing we want to talk about is composition. So composition is really the arrangement of elements within your frame. We're going to go over the rule of thirds a little bit, leading lines, framing, foreground and background elements, color, texture, and shape. When walking into any given situation, you really want to evaluate not only the light, but your subject. What is your subject in the situation? Is it an object, a person, a place, or, you know, color or texture? What is it that you're trying to focus on? And then find a focal point. So the rule of thirds is going to allow you to divide your image up into these nine different areas and then use the intersection points or the lines to add your focal point to those planes so in the example that we have here in front of us the tree was used as the focal point um, we also used the horizon line so we also used that horizontal line to set our horizon so because the sky is interesting we decided to use the lower horizon line but if the sky was very uninteresting or you know there was more interest in the foreground in front of us we would use the higher line to show more of the landscape and less of the sky in this next image we see a lot of shape and we see a lot of lines that are kind of leading your eye directly to this one point so we compose the image so that all these lines are intersecting at one specific point and that is where your viewer is going to see framing your subject is a perfect way to giving it emphasis now you can frame your subject with anything in this image we're framing it with the rock face that is naturally occurring around it but that doesn't mean that you can't actually hold up a frame in front of someone it will frame them either way so look for elements that you can use to give emphasis to your subject in this image we have foreground and background elements and our foreground is really kind of mimicking what's happening in the background and creating this really nice balance between the two. So always look for things in the foreground that can kind of help you to change your composition a little bit or mimic what's going on in the background and it will balance things out very nicely. Color is very important. Your eye is always led to very bright and vibrant colors. So if you have a lot of colors in the background, they will compete with your subject in the foreground. This has a really nice balance because those bright poppy colors in the background give such contrast to that black camera in the foreground. So you can use them to kind of show contrast. In this image, we allow the light to fall from the side, revealing texture. So whenever a light source is hitting something sideways, it's going to kind of reveal texture. And then we doubled that by changing this image into black and white. So that black and white really showcases that gritty texture on these uh, pylons underneath this pier. And then here we have kind of a double whammy. Not only does this shape naturally lead your eye into the Sydney Opera House, it also is a shape showcasing a shape. So this is a very good composition that kind of showcases how one shape can lead you to another. Once you've taken your pictures, you really do have to do some post-processing. Not always, I mean, cameras are getting better at taking some really high quality images, but it is good to kind of go in and make some adjustments. Sometimes you do have to do a little bit of cropping and sometimes you may want to play around with an image. So depending on your camera, you may have some various different features. So we're going to take a look at me at making some slight adjustments to an image on my Samsung Note 10. So this is an image that I took earlier this summer um, while I was taking a walk. And as you can see, I can go into my develop settings and kind of crop around if I really wanted to change the crop on this picture. Um, I can rotate it to change the crop as well. So not just in size, but in rotation. So I'm going to leave it about right here because I actually like how that looks. And then I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is working with some filters. Now, these are on and off filters that do allow me to use the slider to change the intensity and kind of go through them and see if there's anything that I really like. 
I tend to not like working with filters just because it's such a baked in look. I like being able to dial in settings. Um, so even though some of these sometimes work fairly well, and I will agree, you know, they look great on Instagram. Um, I prefer to kind of use the develop feature. So that next tab over the next button over is going to let me use the develop features. And that first one is going to be the brightness um, of the image. So I'm actually going to bring it down a tiny bit. And then we have our exposure settings. So that slider allows me to add or take away exposure. So I'm going to bump it up a tiny bit. And then I have contrast, which I can add a lot of contrast and make things look funky. Or I can take a, the contrast away and make things look really faded. I'm actually going to decrease my contrast just a tiny bit. The next one is going to be our saturation so I can make the colors really really pop or I can take them down to grayscale. So I am going to dial back <laughs> and I'm going to take just a tiny bit of that saturation away and sometimes that's all you need is to take a little bit away. And then the next one is hue so that's going to change all the colors <laughs> it's going to make things look really funky now you can get some really cool looks out of this but you know i'm just going to change my hue and bring it back down to zero <laughs> i prefer the natural look and then we have our white balance so we can set it to auto we can do sunlight we can do uh, cloudy we can do incandescent lighting we can do fluorescence or we can dial it in by color temperature. Uh, so I can eyeball this if I want to, and I'm going to kind of look around and see where I like it. So I'm gonna leave it about right here. And then I'm gonna hit the little check mark to um, approve my changes, and then I can go back to the image. And then I will simply just go ahead and save this image and it's going to give me a new copy on my phone. The library has a lot of resources that are available to you. And these resources are available from home. Um, one that we always recommend to our patrons is our Linda resource. Now it does have to be accessed through our library website. So you do have to go in through that with your library card and pin number. So if you have a library card from a different library, unfortunately, it's not going to work. And I did find a few different courses that I thought were beneficial for you to continue on your journey learning photography. Even if it's mobile photography, it is always beneficial to know more. So these are three different classes that I found for you guys. And then I went over to YouTube and decided to kind of look for a few classes that I thought were great um, that kind of showcased a lot of different tips and tricks uh, of kind of using your phone in everyday photography situations. So these are available for anyone since YouTube is available for everyone. And then I found some online resources for those of you that do prefer to read and things like that. You will have to go to the website. So the title of the uh, article is the first line and the website where I found it is the second line. So you can look those up and kind of go through them. And there is a lot of very useful information in there.